what we did last time. So last time we have seen the modular graphs. And modular graphs were graphs attained, uh, so attached to the subgroups of the modular group. And I said that, so I'm going to consider the simplest cases. Uh, the simplest subgroups are the ones, the smallest subgroups, so they are generated by one element, and these elements were classified as elliptic, elliptic, uh, parabolic, and hyperbolic. And in all these cases, we have looked at the corresponding modular graphs. And in the first case, we have seen that these graphs, so in elliptic, they are also separate to the two cases. So the first one being over the two case. In that case, the graph that we get looks something like this. And it expands in all the directions on the left hand side, but on the right hand side, it doesn't. And if you want to have, uh, if, uh, in the order two case, the picture is something like this, it expands about two. In order three case, I'm going to cheat a little bit. In order three case, you just add a one degree three vertex here. And it doesn't expand on the left, but on the right. And in parabolic case, uh, we have, there is no component in the inside. But outwards, we have some finite number of components. And in the final hyperbolic case, this was the case where you are, you cannot escape to have both number, both inner and outer components in a number of ways. So by this I mean, so they expand infinitely in these directions. Let me just be a little bit sloppy in putting the vertices. I think it's marvelous. So this is what we have seen. And then... Uh, and then we have seen, actually, I, I just remarked in the very last moments that we have seen a map uh, so on on the first part of the world we have the in, uh, we have the binary quadratic forms uh, right so in order to, so we have the binary quadratic forms but for the definite ones I said that the, the situation is trivial so for this one we take delta to be positive which meant that we have indefinite binary quadratic forms so these guys are those which have positive discriminant. And on the other side, we have uh, hyperbolic subgroups. Of the modular this has to say. But here, as I told you, this on this part, PSL2x, so the ID, the quotient did not by PSL2z. And here, I need the quotient passed by the same action. Uh, by, the, by the same group with conjugation action. Okay. And from this part, I have the hyperbolic subgroups, I, we have also seen by solving the Pell equation, x squared minus delta y squared is equal to y, uh, is equal to 4. By solving that equation, I have also written you a generator, a specific generator. Uh, uh, of this element, but I'll come back to that later. So now I'm going to look at this part of me. So this guy, I have also given you, given you, in terms of hyperbolic charts. Okay. So here, I'm going to put right now the hyperbolic charts because it's a it's a group generated by one element. The automorphism group were always cyclic. I we have written the generator. So it's an, a, a subgroup of PSL2Z generated by one hyperbolic element. And all, such a hyperbolic element is given by such a modular graph. Okay, so here I have hyperbolic charts. Okay. And <coughs> so now this, this 
the composition here also has an inverse. So the inverse of the linear okay, so the inverse of the above map is given by. So if you give me a, a hyperbolic subgroup, that means if you, I can find its generator, so we have an element PQRS. Uh, how to get a binary quadratic form? So from here to this place, so how to get a binary quadratic form? If you want to cook up a binary quadratic form, then you need to look at then you need you need to look at the fixed point equation of this binary quadratic form. That means so you you solve uh, u p x plus q over and x plus s is equal to x. Okay, you look at this and then you do computation and get that the coefficient of x squared must be r, the coefficient of x must be s minus p, and then the coefficient of the constant term must be so the constant is must be minus q. But in many cases they they have common divisor. So I divide by that one number delta, and delta is the common divisor. So the greatest, of course, greatest common divisor of uh, R, S minus P, and minus Q. Okay, so let's see this in a, for instance, we looked at the example. So we looked at the matrix 3, minus 4, uh, minus 14, and 19. If you look at this guy, it's a hyperbolic matrix. So if, if you want to cook, then you write here minus 14. This is minus 16, uh, sorry, 16. And then minus 2 is 4. The common divisor of all these guys is 2. So you write by 2. So that's what you get minus 4, 8. What you get as as your form. Okay, so this settles down the one to one to the one to one correspondence between the two objects. And going to do today is now first ask the following question. So it's a very classical question that has been around for many years. So the question one or the question is so given an integer and so does there exist x y Again, z squared. So we are always over integers. So when I say a solution, the solution should be also over integers. So the question is, does there exist x, y in z such that so this equation a x squared plus b x y plus c z squared is equal to n has a solution. So that's the question I want to tackle. So the question is very classical, and again, it it is the nature of the question is completely different between positive and negative discriminants. If the discriminant is negative, that means if delta so if delta is less than zero, uh, then if you have a solution, then it's already fine. Many because all the, so if you have a definite form with say positive first component like x squared plus y squared, and if you want to solve the equation x squared plus y squared is equal to 200 something, then x squared and y squared can be at most, so they have an upper bound, right? So, they, so the, the x and y cannot be both bigger than root 200. So, which means that if you have a solution, then x is bounded, y is bounded, so they are yeah, allowed to have a finite number. So that means that if solution exists, then it, there is always finite number. If it exists, may not. Uh, but here, in the case of uh, indefinite binary quadratic forms, the solution, uh, so the question is not trivial. If there is one, 
So his effect is if there is one, then there is infinity many. Okay, so let me write this. So if delta is less than zero, then, then if there exists one, uh, so, so then there may exist. Uh, if delta is less than zero, then if it, and at most finite many. But if delta is positive, uh, then if there exists one, one solution, then there are infinite solutions. Why? Do you see why? Is this the case? So let's start with this uh, our form. So let's try to solve this equation. And whose answer? So which has a solution? So let's write minus seven x squared plus eight x squared uh, plus two y squared is equal to. So let's let's start with uh, let's put instead of x and y one one so that we know. So it's minus seven plus 8 plus 2, that's 3. Okay. So suppose we are given this, okay, and we are looking for x and y, and we already know that 1, 1 is a solution. Okay. How to produce the other infinity in solutions? You must act by this matrix on solution. So right, the automorphism, right? So you act on f by the automorphism. Right? So, if, so we know that 1, 1, so example, 1, 1 is a solution, so x, y is equal to 1, 1 is the solution. Okay. So that acts to 1, 1 by the matrix. So this 3 minus 4, 3 minus 4, 19. Act on this matrix and then you get minus 1 and then you get minus 1 and what? Minus 5? Right. Uh, plus 5, yes. And hopefully this would give a solution. Okay, let's plug in. So minus 7 plus 40. Okay. Uh, this didn't give. Maybe I should do it the other way around. Act on the other side. <laughs> this is left right problem that I am confused. Yeah. Oh, yes. Minus 1 1. Sorry, 1 1. Uh, now, what's this? Minus 11. And 15. I hope this works. <laughs> no, minus 1, 5 is a solution. It is a solution? Yes. Did I make it in the same yeah. Okay. <laughs> How is it? So minus 7 is plus minus 40. Ah, okay, so that's minus 40, yeah. yeah. So, sorry, sorry. Like 1, 1. So that's uh, like uh, minus 1, 5. This, is a, this should be a solution. It's still really a complication. Minus 7. Minus 40 plus uh, 50. Plus 50. Oh, is, ah, is right, so that's the third of the yes. I'm looking for zero. <laughs> so yeah. So it, it fixes, right? So the, the, why? Because this is this generates, this is an element in the automorphism. Automorphism of the form F, that's a minus 7, 8. Okay, and this element is a hyperbolic element, right? So you, I can take the powers of it, which gives me the infinite mean solutions. Okay, so the question is, how are you going to find one? Yeah. Yeah. So this is the problem. F, F is this one. Also, yes. So it's minus seven eight two. It's this form minus seven x squared plus eight x y. So the idea is the following. So you look at all the possible values of f. Okay. So you look at, so we define the values of f to be the set of f of x, y, where x, y is x. You look at this set, this is a huge set of integers. 
So this is f of x, y, in z. So you look at all the values. Okay. And then observe the following. So this is, so this step, this is something, so I said, so I proposition maybe. Proposition is that well, f is in my PSI. So this, the image set is invariant. So if you change f by a form which is equivalent to f under a transformation, then the values will not be So then, I want to come back to here, and I want to interpret this problem in terms of hyperbolic chunks. So in order to do that, let me make, let me be so a little bit precise on this part of the world. So let me tell you how to go from one side to the other, from the hyperbolic subgroups or hyperbolic elements to chunks. Here is the here is the way. So from from chunks to uh, from chunks to some. Okay. So here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick a particular example. Uh, you will see the general picture immediately. So let me look at this. Say you are given this, okay? I'm going to give you an algorithm, whatever that means, in this case. So you are given this graph. How are you going to find a binary quadratic form or an, a hyperbolic element? Here's the way to do you, you so, so there are degree two vertices in the middle that we should not present. Okay. You pick yourself a base edge, one. So for my purposes, I'm going to pick this one. Okay. And then I'm going to rotate counterclockwise along the unique cycle of the graph. This cycle that we usually call spine. When I see a degree 3 vertex, then I need to choose between left and right, because this is a ribbon graph. I know left and I know right. Okay. And then I see uh, a black vertex and I need to I need not to choose anything. Right? So now I'm going to walk in this direction. Okay? So I first thing I'm going to see is a white vertex. So so someone who is walking here, did he turn left or right? Right. He turns right, right? So L is for left, so L squared is for right. So that's what I wrote. I write S squared. And then I'm at this vertex. So I'm, when I see a black vertex, then I put an S. Okay. And then here, so I'm at this edge now. Now I have to turn left to be on the spine. So I write N. And then I'm at this vertex. I need an S because I visit a black vertex. And now again, I see I have to turn left because right is out. I turn left and then a black vertex. I turn left and a black vertex. And here I have to turn right because left, when I turn, if I turn left and I go out, so I have to turn right. 
I turn right, so I'm here, now I need to turn left. LS, and then here again LS, right? so because I have to turn left here too, so LS, LS, that's LS squared, let me write. And then I'm at this guy, again I have to turn left, and then I, I will be here, and then I have to again turn left, so it's twice turn, let me just put here. F4, four times, and then I'm, I'm back. Okay. So now you multiply this matrix, and what you are going to see is this is equal to 3 minus 4 minus 4. Is it clear? Yes. The first choice is arbitrary. Or? The first choice of H is arbitrary, but the work that you are going to write is a cyclic word, is going to be a cyclic permutation. Oh, yes. Because if you, so you just rotate. Okay. So once you have the matrix, then you get back. You can get back to here. And if you are given a matrix now any matrix P, Q, R, S, then you decompose it in terms of these stars, L and S, the matrices, and then you write out the corresponding chart in order to be, be <coughs> you know, in order to, you know, be compatible with this structure of the spa. So this is how we get it. Questions? What is that is called a spa? Is this unique cycle of the hyperbolic chart. That's what I'm calling this. Okay. So this is how we get it. So now I'm... Okay. Here's what I'm going to do now. So I started doing this by with, with this vertex, right? And the form... I'm sorry? Yes. So this graph corresponds to a subgroup of PSI to them, right? Yes, it, and it exactly corresponds to this to the subgroup generated by this matrix. Uh, so what what do you call a chart? The matrix or the graph? The graph is chart. The graph is chart. Okay. Yes, because chart is is uh, the Turkish word for view. Yeah. Right. So oh, okay. <laughs> this looks like a view. Right. So that's <laughs> the reason behind. By the way, I, as I always do, I made a mistake again. Uh. I sure. uh, are there some conditions on the graph in order to obtain an hyperbolic element? Yes, it has to have both in and out components. Okay. That's the only condition. And I made a mistake. So this should this will not work. <laughs> this is not going to work. So let me correct this. Uh, it should work for this edge. For this one. Not for this one. Not for this one, not for this one, I'm sorry. So if you write the word looking at this. That means only uh, that I need to put all this stuff, so add S to the power in front. <coughs> so S, and S, and to the power, and then S here. Okay, sorry. Now, this should be correct. And now, again, I said that this guy corresponds to this matrix and this matrix is the automorphism is the automorphism it generates the automorphism group of the form minus seven eight and two okay. so since there's the one to one correspondence I'm going to label this edge with this one 
with this form binary quadratic form. Okay? And then the next edge, this one here, this is I I I I pay the price of multiplying by S when I pass to here, right? So that's what I do when I label this edge by a quadratic form. I'm going to label this next edge by S times by acting on this by S and this new number we computed it as two minus eight minus seven. And then <coughs> in order to go to this edge, I have to act on this binary quadratic form. I turn the left here, so I need to act on this binary quadratic form by n, and that would give a minus thirteen. And two, and then to pass to here, I need to multiply act on this guy by s, and that would give me two minus four <coughs> minus thirteen, and then again by l. Uh, so this would give me minus fifteen zero two, and this gives me minus two zero. Uh, sorry, two zero minus fifteen. And then, so here, so this edge will receive minus 13, minus 4, 2, and this, 2, 4, minus 13. So now I labeled all the all the edges of the spine, and in fact all the edges of the graph by binary quadratic forms, and this is a one-to-one -one correspondence because the cycle is the automorphism group. Okay. So anyway, I need I want to stop right now a little bit and make some observations just by looking at the numbers here appearing. So what do you see? What is what is a common property of the edges here on the spine? It's now time to do a little bit mathematics and draw conclusions. So this is automorphism of the obvious. So this this yes. element generates the automorphism group of this precise form. Yes, but for all of this. Uh, if you want to pass here, if you want to write the automorphism group of this one, then you need to conjugate by S. If you want to get this one, then if you need to conjugate this subgroup by S, uh, etc. What are common properties of these forms? Let me start. If the two, so the first so conclusions, So you see the action of S is only on B. 
C and A are only changed, so they change places only, right? So that means that this pair of edges, so if you have a pair of edges that are that share a vertex of degree two, then you, their their B terms, the absolute value, are equal. Right. And the B term I can I can I can find by solving the equation uh, you know delta because I know the delta here because I know the form delta is equal to B squared minus four AC right so in order to decide what these two forms are I I need only to know delta and A and C okay so the absolute B's are always equal one is with plus the other one is with minus okay that's first so if two vertices so if two forms with two edges, edges share a degree to vertex. Then absolute values of B's are equal. I mean by absolute values of B's, I mean the absolute value of so B of the one is equal to the absolute B of the other. What I have seen. Sorry? Uh, a and A and the C, uh, they... Yes, they, they, change, they change the order, right? So another conclusion that we can draw is the following. When you look at the edges on the spine, right? So you see here, so here A times C is less than zero. 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 That's a common for all for all the edges. So let me just write so spinal edges have AC is equal to zero. Okay. A, sorry, less than zero is less than zero. And vice versa. I'm going to write now if so if I'm going to erase some stuff and write off spine edges, which are not of the spine. Okay. But this is an if and only if, and the converse is also true. I mean, if A and C is less, A times C is less than zero, then this binary quadratic form should correspond to an edge on the spine. That's also a given. What else? Yes. The number of spokes mm -hmm. of the wheel related to the trace of matrix? Yes. Ah. I could not come because I got lost. I was listening to you and tried to come, but it looks right here, this example. Yeah, it works. It, you can compute. Ah, I can compute. You can compute the trace and the discriminant by just looking at the this one. It's not so easy, but it's possible. So it's like this this graph here that what we call chart is like the identity. Okay? It has every information that you might need concerning the binary quality form. So it, sh it should we should be able to use this in order to solve the problem that I'm started with. That is which integers are represented. And for this, here is what I'm going to do. Now let me just write, let me just look at here. So here, so, so let's now start with this. So here these are two forms, their absolute b's are equal, so that they, so this, there's one two here and one minus 13 here, which determines everything about this edge, this pair of edges, right? What I'm going to do is the following. So I'm going to write, um, outside, the one, the value which is negative, okay, so I'm going to erase these forms, so I keep in mind that one is minus three, and minus 13, the other is two, okay. So now this is, this is a face of the graph, okay, and I'm going to write outside the integer two, okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, the integer minus 13. Okay, and inside the remaining integer 2. Okay, and now observe the following. So this bus 
this was this was you know two minus thirteen zero and the other one was minus thirteen zero two. Okay. So here you see we see a two here and a two here. Okay. So the forms corresponding to these two edges they have a, a, they share a vertex uh, so an edge with the face labeled two. Okay. So now I erase this guy and write the outer face minus fifty. And here again, these two forms have a 2, the B components are irrelevant. Now I erase these faces and write minus 30. Okay. And here again, so there, is, there should be a 2 here, uh, sorry, minus 7 here, to that face. And note that this form here, like this form here, has minus 7 inside, so there should be a 3 here. Right, so I erase this one, and now write a 3 here, okay. So once I start labeling, then I do not need any of the B values. And then, uh, so inside is finished because it had two faces that are on the spine. So here I have three here. So these two forms have minus 10, 0, 3. Right? So this face should be minus 10. And this, these guys have three minus 6, 7. So this face should be labeled minus 7. And this number 3 here is equal to that 3 up above that we saw the equation. So that 3 here is exactly <laughs> is this 3. Oh. What does this mean? This means that uh, so here's the theorem, written right over here. Is that so there is a one to one correct so F the equation A squared plus B X Y plus C Y squared is equal to N as a solution. If and only if the corresponding chart. So these these things I call faces. They are faces of the graph, uh, and these numbers I call labels. So if the corresponding chart has label exactly equal to n, n square three. Sorry, you take a square three n. And uh, I mean, you can multiply x, y by some, some content. Yeah, sure. There are obvious obvious conditions. Whatever n is, if the label, if there is a label, then there should be a solution. That's the case. It's always the case. Whatever n is, if there is, I mean, if n is. you Right. If there is, if it has a solution, then I can find the label. And if I can find the label, then it has a solution. That's the claim. So no matter n is, because if n is n is a square, then there are conditions on on a, z, and c, right? So for in the first place, for I assume a, b, and c are they don't have any common divisors. How much time do I have? Like <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Five minutes. Sorry? Five. Five minutes. Okay. Right. So we could solve. Okay. So maybe I should finish here because the next five minutes is not going to be enough for what I'm going to talk about next. But, uh, so let me just point out again that if you want to solve this equation, then you go back to the chart and look at label the faces and look at uh, the corresponding uh, 
Uh, I'm just going to show one thing. Debbie, could you please? Uh, uh, so there is a one to one correspondence. So you can solve this problem if and only if this has such a vertex, and you cannot if and only if there is no such a label. And this is a this is a finite time algorithm. So you can write explicitly the algorithm and you can solve it in a very all square root of n. So it's it's almost does it work? This one. So now I'm going so this is the part of you know, advertisement part. So this is a project that we run. Okay. So this is what I'm going to show is a project that we run. Hopefully soon there will be so this is the web application if we will be uh, from the uh, iPad application and the computer program too. So what can you see? Sunburst. This is so every cell here corresponds to an element of the modular group. Okay, and so this has various relations. The modular group has various relations that Mohammed is going to talk about. The continued fractions, some of them he already mentioned, continued fractions and its actions on the other stuff. But here in this case, what I what I want to do, so that what this should do is you should you know we are going to select a cell here. So that cell corresponds to an element of the modular group. Okay. So this is not something due to the bipartite failed tree that I already drawn you. When you click on here, then it should give you the identity. It should give you the corresponding binary quadratic form. It should give you, it should draw its chart together with labels. And then it should give you, so this topic has relations also to, so that this problem is interesting because of very classical problem starting with Fermat, Fermat's last theorem. So, the, so it's, you want to solve, the, uh, so these binary quadratic forms in the number theory world, they correspond to ideal classes in number fields for those who you know. Who know. So these ideal, I, there is a one to one for almost one to one correspondence between ideal class and binary quadratic forms. And the class number problem of Gauss, 200 years old, is asks which one of these ideal classes, so whether the, you can factorize uniquely a given number in a number field or not, in some number field. So these binary quadratic forms represent uh, ideal classes here. So if you can find the multiplication in terms of these ideal classes, if you can kind of find the number of ideal classes, then you are going to solve the Gauss problem. So it has relations to that. So that the so this is the arithmetic part of the world. I leave that aside. So this should compute the identity of a given chart, uh, the identity card of a given chart, chart and uh, it should solve any question concerning charts, concerning binary quadratic forms. Hopefully. In, in Six months or so, but it's still you know walking, <laughs> trying to walk. Back. I couldn't say the word typhoon there. The next thing I wanted to do was to look at the action. I I, did, I couldn't talk about look at the action of flips on the set of, on the on the groupoid of charts and tell you that the fundamental group of, compute the fundamental groupoid. But I didn't have the time for that. Just let me show, let me just tell that it's also. Uh, it's also very interesting. It turns out to be the, the famous Thompson's groups F and T. Uh, they they appear as the fundamental groups of this one, which tells you the mapping class group is related to the Thompson's group T and F in this case. But I didn't have time to say passion. So that's all I want to say. Thank you very much for your time. Questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, how 
Repeat the act on the chunks. Repeat the triangle here. So these are built to triangles. So let's do it outside. If you can get. Um, so this is some. So these are these are these two vertices. You pick a pair of triangles. Okay. Then you erase this. You erase this completely and then go this diagonal and then the rest is the same. So the other two vertices is on the edge of triangle and the sorry? The other two vertices in the graph is on the edge of the triangle. Yes. And the other is This is something that I, I vaguely mentioned that these are these things when you, if you want to study the sun, so these things are appear naturally as due to the triangulation of the surface. Here our surface, uh, I mean you can embed, so the, the surface that you construct from bipartite ribbon or bipartite ferrigraph is the disk, uh, the Poincaré disk, and if you caution out, uh, then you, what you are going to see is an annulus here, so it has two boundaries, so this is what it attaches you to, there's one boundary here, there's another boundary here, and these are graphs expanding to the boundary. Did I ask you a question? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Could you give uh, an example, of application of this? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, so this, so this is identity. Okay. So this blue line here, it it gives you a path on the, it gives you a path on the ferry tree, but here it's a path on the disks. And now, what, when I select right now, the program only knows that what you selected over here is an element of the modular group, and it's, it computes it, uh, computes the corresponding modular group somewhere here, sorry. Which tell you... Oops, I can seem to be formatted. Right, so here on the corner here, it writes the elements of the matrix, or the entries of the matrix, so if you say, if you want to work on this matrix, it tells you that it corresponds to 8, so left up, 8 minus 3, 11 minus 4. So, it's, so this element is hyperbolic, you can just look at its trace, and it gives you the decomposition in terms of R, S, R, S, R is the same as L, so R is equal to L, so you can replace it by L. So it gives you the composition in terms of the generators S and N. And uh, so it, it should tell you the uh, type, but it's uh, in this case obvious. And the, the remaining, the blue ones, are those which have the same trace, which means that they, uh, the blue ones are those cells which have exactly the same discriminant with the, with the selective one. And the continued fraction here, it corresponds to the uh, it corresponds to the uh, number um, 8 over 11. So the con if you write the co corresponding continued fraction, as explained in Mohammed's talk, then that should give you 8 over 11. So you look at 8 plus 1 over, so n0 plus 1 over n1 plus etc. corresponding to this one. Then you get that one. And as I said, the aim is to write, is to mark. So the trace is too vague for us. We want to see ex explicitly the conjugacy classes. So this should light up, actually. That's the thing that we are working on right now. When you click an element, it should light up all the other elements that are in the, in the, same, in the same conjugacy class, uh, which is a little bit harder to do in terms of computer It's hard to communicate with computers. Uh, uh, gotcha. Let's start again.
Thank you.